been observing our home for 40 years now. In the last 20 of those, we have focused intensely on planet Earth. With new technologies and capabilities, accumulating a mass of data that is now revealing a complex and ever-changing living planet. from space for the last two decades in high resolution detail watching our every move the clouds and aerosols winds and hurricanes forests and cities droughts and floods the ocean currents and plankton life in the ocean and on land land cover aerosols chlorophyll concentrations Wave heights, ozone concentrations, atmospheric moisture, the human footprint, sea level change, and temperatures and moisture in the soil. Now scientists have a high definition data set spanning two decades to study and to learn from. While well, NASA has a fleet of satellites that are always measuring Earth, they're looking at land, oceans, atmospheres, ice all together. Uh, the particular visualization uh, represents the measurement of all life on Earth over 20 years. I personally find it mesmerizing. Um, you're watching the Earth breathe here. The seasons are changing, ice is coming in and retreating. You can see the forests on land and green expanding and contracting. You can see the deserts moving to the ocean. You can see biological deserts in the centers of the ocean, represented by blues and purples. And then as you look farther north in the Atlantic or towards Antarctica, you can see these greens and yellows. Explosion of life in the ocean, just like on land in the spring and summer. Incredible. What we see for the first time is how the oceans and the land behave at the same time through time for 20 years. We've never had data like these before. Half of our photosynthesis occurs in the oceans and the other half on land. And having these data to show both at the same time, day after day, month after month, year after year for 20 years, is a great tool to study life on Earth. NASA has observed many aspects of the coupled land, ocean, atmosphere system and how they interact. For example, we see that with warmer surface temperatures, the growing season is getting longer at higher northern latitudes and spring is coming earlier. With satellite data, we're able to map this continuously across the Earth's surface and across the United States and across Alaska. Before that time, you had to rely where you had weather stations, and so you had points here, points there, but you never had continuous data like these. So using these data, we can look over very large areas and see regional effects, and sometimes these effects are positive in that nothing bad has happened. So it's only with these data we're able to do this over all these areas at the same time, and this is made possible by the use of Earth viewing satellites, which orbit the Earth day after day, month after month, year after year. And these data are the basis for saying these things about Earth with confidence because we measure them. The view from space is opened our eyes to so many different things. You can see transitions from La Nina to El Nino, represented by huge blooms of life across the Pacific Ocean at the equator bigger and wider than the United States. You can see greening of 
the Arctic. You can see earlier summers, later winters, and you can see the emergence of harmful nuisance algae. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Charting the carbon dioxide cycle through the atmosphere, land and ocean is essential to understanding the environmental changes that man is driving. Higher carbon dioxide or CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere appears as red and yellow, while lower than average CO2 is shown as blue. The pulsing of the data is due to the day-night cycle of plant photosynthesis. As CO2 is lifted away from the surface, it is rapidly spread around the world by high-altitude winds. CO2 builds up in the northern hemisphere winter when plants are dormant. By summer, photosynthesis draws massive amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere, resulting in lower CO2 throughout the northern hemisphere. and decay of vegetation in the northern lands causes the seasonal change in atmospheric CO2. Long term, however, it is human activity that is increasing overall CO2 levels. So 2017 was the second warmest year ever recorded and the warmest non-El Nino year. That makes five of the warmest years ever recorded just since 2010. And NASA scientists have taken weather station data from over 6,000 stations, and we've connected the dots to understand how our Earth is changing. In this animation, you can see those warmer temperatures growing as we look at how much the high latitudes in places like Alaska have warmed since 1950. So across the globe, we're seeing a consistent trend towards warming, but with twice as much warming across the high latitudes like Alaska. This rapid increase in overall global temperatures is clearly defined when satellite data is added to the model. The ability to expand your senses into space, compress time, watch in a visualizations like these, um, see how the ecosystems of land, ocean, atmosphere, ice, all interact, and then be able to rewind it and watch it again and again. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Ask any astronaut. When they look down at Earth, they see a single environment. No borders, no claims, just a single planet which we all have to rely on. With this data, scientists can check up on the health of the planet. One primary concern is the ozone layer. So we know the Montreal Protocol was a huge success. This was signed in the late 1980s when scientists and policymakers from around the world gathered together to try to save the ozone layer. The chemicals they regulated persist in the atmosphere for many decades. They thin the ozone layer and they create a seasonal hole over Antarctica. They basically take away part of our planet's natural sunscreen and that increases the risk of skin cancer and damage to plants. Scientists have projected the ozone hole will disappear almost completely by 2075. But several factors could delay that outcome. There are some industrial compounds that are not banned by the Montreal Protocol, but as they enter the atmosphere, they will also hurt the ozone layer. But the unregulated compounds have a short lifespan in the atmosphere, unlike the chlorofluorocarbons that were originally regulated. So they have a short-lived impact on ozone, and we don't think they'll delay recovery by more than a few years. We projected by 2050, more than half of the ozone-depleting compounds in the atmosphere will come from long-lived substances banned by the protocol. Because these compounds stay in the air for such a long time compared to the unregulated short-lived compounds, they will have a disproportionate and lingering impact on ozone. Any non-compliance with protocol can have significant consequences. 
And the really big uncertainty in ozone layer recovery is climate change. There are many naturally produced ozone depleting substances that are emitted by the oceans. And as the oceans continue to warm due to climate change, those emissions will increase and that will further delay ozone recovery. Scientists want to understand better how climate change will affect ozone recovery. This is a hard problem. As a scientific community, we need to work on this major issue. We now have a powerful new tool to simulate atmosphere and its interaction with land and ocean to study this issue. And that's what we're going to do. At the top of the world, however, the Arctic ice continues to shrink. Sea ice is the ice that grows and melts within the Arctic Ocean. It grows in the wintertime when it gets cold and melts during through the summertime. And so it doesn't raise sea level, but it's very important for the global climate system because the ice is very bright and reflective, reflects a lot of the sun's energy that comes in during the summertime and helps keep the Arctic cooler. It's like a refrigerator for the global climate system by keeping the, the, uh, the globe cooler than it normally would be without sea ice. And as we lose the ice, it's like we're opening the refrigerator door and not cooling things as efficiently as we used to. Constant observation since the 70s lets us see a trend. The Arctic sea ice has been changing quite rapidly. We've seen a decline over 35 plus years of a record. The last 15 years particularly, it's been accelerating. So really, it's become a matter of when, not if, we lose the Arctic sea ice because we have a lot of warmth in the Arctic. It's gonna to continue to warm. We're gonna to continue to melt sea ice. There's uncertainty as to exactly when that will happen, but sometime in the not too distant future, faster than we used to think, um, the Arctic Ocean will be substantially ice free by the end of summer. Arctic sea ice is not the only place we're seeing big changes. We're also seeing big changes in Greenland, which is the big mass of ice uh, on top of the continent. And we're seeing more and more melt. We're seeing ice calving off as icebergs. So we're seeing big masses of, of ice loss over the last uh, several years. That means that that ice is going into the ocean, that's raising sea level, so that's gonna have big impacts down the road as we continue to lose more and more ice from Greenland. Ancient air bubbles trapped in ice enable us to step back in time and see what else atmosphere and climate were like in the distant past. Today we stand on the threshold of a new geologic era which some term the Anthropocene, where the climate is very different to the one our ancestors knew. We can see that a warmer world means that there's an impact for warming temperatures in the Arctic, melting sea ice. That sea ice leads to larger sea level rise. So NASA scientists are on the ground in airplanes and using our satellite data to understand how what starts in the Arctic doesn't actually stay in the Arctic. The hope is that all this data collection will mean that real-world problems can be reassessed and new angles explored. A case in point, dolphin and whale stranding. Could this accumulated satellite data help address the problem? Cape Cod in the US state of Massachusetts is home to one of the most frequent marine mammal stranding sites in the world. If we can get there quickly and provide supportive care, they have a much better prognosis in terms of survival. Scientists know very little about why these mammals strand, and only a quick and efficient response in these events will save lives. Katie Moore works on the front line and has fine-tuned rescue efforts. If we can develop an algorithm that pieces together the different variables that may be causing mass strandings or driving mass strandings, then we have the ability to then prevent them. We can have teams that are out on the shore looking for animals in those hot spots, knowing that all those variables have come together and this is the likely point in time where we're likely to see it. But we can also have teams ready to respond so that if they do strand, we're there that much faster and more animals will survive the event. Marine biologists from the U.S. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management were also looking at this problem. For the large proportion of these strandings, the animals are across the ages um, in pretty good health and there's no really immediate 
evidence as to why they actually strand. One possibility is geomagnetic perception, the ability to navigate using Earth's magnetic field, which is believed to be used by marine mammals. Could changes in the magnetic field confuse the animal? Geomagnetic pulses or storms can be caused by space weather. Geomagnetic perception is one of the theories, and I thought, well, hmm, if a magnetometer can pick it up, maybe the animals actually can pick it up. Dr. Reed consulted with NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center. The coolest thing was that we realized that nobody had really taken a cold, hard data science analysis look at the problems. What we were trying to look at here was if there was a potential driver or, or relationship or correlation between the occurrence of mass strandings and any solar activity. The data that we have correlated or analyzed so far is information about the local geomagnetic conditions. We have long data records from geophysical observatories of the local geomagnetic field variations and marine mammal stranding. Their analysis was inconclusive. They needed more data from other environmental conditions. Easy fix correlation between a geomagnetic pulse and oh, a stranding doesn't seem to be very evident, but what it does show is that there are multiple variables involved in this equation, and that the geomagnetic storms could just be one very small part of it. Significant still, but it looks like there are multiple oceanographic and environmental elements. With more data in hand, it was time to expand the team. They recruited statisticians, and the expertise of NASA Earth Science data analyst and oceanographer, Erdem Karakolyu. A data set, no matter, no matter its shape or, or content, always has a story to tell. Trying to figure out um, how different data are connected, I think, require a, a, a wide diversity of skills and, and uh, background knowledge. For example, I'll be explaining how a mass stranding occurs and how we respond to try and understand why I'm presenting the data in a certain way. And my colleagues from NASA will, will look at me and ask questions that I wouldn't think to ask because I take for granted my understanding. And they're coming at it from a totally new angle with no background. These data sets may reveal a pattern allowing scientists to predict the likelihood and location of mass stranding before it happens. We've really just sort of slowly peeled the first layer of this onion back. And I think that there's so many more layers that still need to be addressed and looked at. And I hope that we can actually find additional collaborators, additional funding partners to really bring all the data that's really available to really give this the study and the scrutiny that it deserves. And we are also going to make all these data sets available to the entire scientific community so that we can utilize the entire scientific community to take an attack and, and, and you know, uh, uh, approach to this problem. I think that there will be other things that to take and run with, uh, get new ideas, maybe add more data. And I'm hoping also that it will be a, a model for how um, uh, projects can then be open to um, the wider public. The ability to release animals after they've stranded is tremendous. When we do that, I mean, that's the best feeling in the world after all of that hard work. Those questions that seem unanswerable, if you give them time and support and effort and put people on them, we can do amazing things. Data from satellites reveals the interconnection between air, sea, and land. This is a visualization of three aerosols, dust, smoke, and sea salt. The Calypso satellite data reveals in 3D how dust from the arid Sahara Desert is lifted by the winds each year and transported nearly 5,000 kilometers across the Atlantic Ocean. Some of it settles in the Amazon basin, the largest rainforest on the planet. Sahara dust contains phosphorus, an important nutrient for plants. Calypso shows that on average, 182 million tons of dust leaves Africa each year. 
When the Sahel was dry, the dust transport to the Amazon in the next year would increase. When it was wet, dust transport would decrease. We can now track global precipitation, wind currents, cloud cover and ocean temperature. Satellites have detected a shift in phytoplankton populations across the planet's five great ocean basins, showing the expansion of biological deserts where little life thrives. Diatoms are one of the most abundant types of marine phytoplankton, but a new 15-year-long NASA study reveals global populations have declined. Diatoms, like all phytoplankton, have chlorophyll, the same photosynthesizing pigment as plants. They occupy the surface of the ocean, where they harvest light from the sun. In large numbers, diatoms form colorful swirling blooms that can be seen from space. According to the study, significant decreases in populations, shown here in red, are mainly in the northern hemisphere. Diatoms rely on nutrients such as nitrate, silicate and iron to reach the surface layer where they live. What our study shows is that the availability of these nutrients has changed due to the way they cycle within the water column. Diatoms occupy the surface area of the ocean called the mixed layer. Nutrients collect on the ocean floor and are cycled up to this layer. Various physical forces can cause the depth of the mixed layer to become shallower so that fewer nutrients reach the diatoms. Without these, their populations decline. This map shows areas on the globe where the depth of the mixed layer shallowed. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why these changes have happened. Things like wind, circulation and temperature can affect the way these nutrients are brought to the surface layer. We hope a longer study can yield more information on whether these changes are in fact a trend or variability. Next-generation satellites are reaching orbit now to continue this important work. They will collect data, maintain observation continuity, and allow scientists to track the changes in our environment. They can then model dynamic simulations to better understand this unique planet and the myriad of life forms that rely on it. Space is vast, yet collisions are commonplace. Gas and dust electrostatically flock together. Gravity takes over, coalescing grains into rocks, rocks into boulders, then asteroids colliding again and again, striking planets and each other. Stars collide, creating monsters of light and energy. Even galaxies collide over millions of years. Space is a rough place to be. That peaceful night sky cloaks a hidden danger. It might appear bejeweled, docile and permanent, but if you look closely, you can see things happening, violent things.
stars engulfing planets and each other, protoplanets colliding, explosions rippling through gas clouds triggering the birth of young stars, black holes devouring everything in their path. Closer to home, a more immediate danger is the debris from the creation of our solar system, spinning about in a heliocentric orbit just waiting to bang into something, something like Earth. Collision avoidance is the name of the game, and we now have the technology to do something about it. Catalina Sky Survey and other survey programs are really sort of the start of the whole planetary protection ecosystem. It starts with discovery, goes on to follow-up and characterization, impact risk analysis, uh, mitigation studies, but you can't follow up and you can't characterize and you can't uh, calculate the impact risk of something you don't discover. In order to find a near-Earth asteroid, we take four images of a, of a patch of sky separated by about five minutes. And we take those four images and we blink them really fast and it creates this little animation so we can see that the stars in the background are static as they should be. And if there's anything that's moving, it'll pop out. And our software compares those images and identifies things that are not moving, which are stars, and removes those, identifies things that that are transient from frame to frame and tries to link those up. We've probably seen about a million asteroids in the last seven years that the PANSARS has been operating. It's like picking a needle out of a haystack. We're looking for distinctive motion, and when we see distinctive motion in asteroids, we report them to the Minor Planet Center. The Minor Planet Center is the sort of world clearinghouse for near-Earth asteroids. The Center for NEO Studies takes the uh, observations from the Minor Planet Center and computes the high precision orbits that we use to make predictions. CNEOS is also kind of an early warning system for newly discovered asteroids. We take the early data and we compute whether or not that asteroid could hit the Earth. If there's a chance, we'll send out an early warning and alert for follow-up observations so that we can get more data and then we would know perhaps whether it can hit the Earth or not. Asteroid impacts are a fact of life. The Earth has been impacted by asteroids continually through its history. We saw in 2013 in, in Russia a fairly small, by the standards of what we're finding, asteroid did hit the Earth. I feel a little bit like a guardian of the planet and doing my bit to try to protect people. It is a, a, a long-term process. It's going to take many, many years to find all of the dangerous asteroids. The goal is to find near-Earth asteroids before they find us. Having the right tools helps us look further away in greater detail. The Hubble Space Telescope was one such tool that was able to capture the first spectacular impact seen in our solar system. The Shoemaker-Levy 9 cometary fragments which struck Jupiter, leaving a surprising impression. Even more remarkable was the recent arrival of an interstellar object. It was a special day when this object was first uh, discovered. Uh, we have been waiting for the discovery of an interstellar object for decades, basically. Well, when I first heard about this interstellar object, it was very exciting just from a scientific point of view that finally there's uh, been an actual observation of such an object. This object is simply a piece of another solar system that was expelled and it has been traveling through interstellar space for hundreds of millions of years, billions of years, we don't know. A number of our uh, survey projects and other observatories uh, immediately turned their telescopes to take observations of this object. From the observations we have so far, it uh, looks like it's a very elongated object, uh, maybe uh, about a quarter mile in length. We think this object, 2017 U1, is very long, perhaps 400 meters or so long and very narrow, skinny, perhaps maybe 40 meters or so in the other dimensions. That's a very unusual shape. We don't see that in our solar system. None of the asteroids in our solar system look like that. So it's very puzzling how it could have obtained this shape. We also see that it's uh, uh, very reddish. 
uh, in color, which uh, indicates that uh, it's been uh, uh, possibly in space a, a long time uh, and irradiated by uh, not only the light from our sun, but uh, other suns as well. well. There's still quite a bit to learn about this interstellar object and, and limited time because it's on its way out of the solar system. It's fading very fast. It's a relatively uh, small object, so it's very dim. But we are continuing to try to use NASA assets like the Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer to take uh, observations to determine more about its uh, size and composition. NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office has a near-Earth object observations program which funds efforts that survey the skies to look for near-Earth asteroids and to calculate their orbits and their trajectories and to determine if any of them might pose a hazard to Earth. And as part of doing that, some amazing discoveries can happen and the discovery of this interstellar object was one of them. As our observational capabilities improve, PanSTARS has been getting better, other surveys have been getting better. There are a new generation surveys that will come online. We will be detecting more of these in the future. New observatories are being constructed. To be launched in the coming year, the James Webb Telescope will orbit at Earth's L2 Lagrange point 1.5 million miles from Earth away from the Sun. Its low temperature sensors will be shielded from the Sun, Earth and Moon. There are also three new ground-based observatories underway. A multinational project being built in Hawaii, the 30-meter telescope, or TMT, will use 492 hexagonal elements, each about 1.44 meters, to construct the single primary mirror of 30 meters diameter. The secondary mirror will be 3.1 meters in diameter. The largest of all will be Europe's extremely large telescope, or ELT. The primary mirror consists of 798 segments, each 1.4 meters wide, but only 50 millimeters thick, with a light collecting area of 978 square meters. The optical design calls for an immense secondary mirror, 4 meters in diameter, bigger than the primary mirrors of any of ESO's telescopes at La Silla. Then there is the giant Magellan Telescope, currently under construction in the Chilean Andes, which will be ready by 2022. It consists of seven 8.4 meter diameter mirrors, making a total effective aperture of 24.5 meters. Housed in a rotating 22 story high building, it will produce images 10 times sharper than Hubble, with a total collection area of 368 square meters. This is a project that we began in 2003. It was a small group of U.S. institutions and has now grown to an international project that includes Australia, Korea, Chile, and most recently, Brazil. The next steps as we launch construction of this telescope are to build the mount, the steel mount that will hold the mirrors for the telescope, uh, to build the uh, enclosure, which is a 22-story building that has to rotate uh, to allow you to uh, move to different parts of the sky as you're looking out with the telescope. It's a, it's a new epoch in, in the field of astronomy. It's a new epoch for cosmology, astrophysics, and the history of the universe. And so we'll be able to see things further and fainter than anyone has ever seen before. And it just takes us to that next level of technical capability, and these technical leaps are what enable new discoveries. The first four giant mirrors for Magellan have been manufactured. Number five is underway, as is construction at the site in the Chilean Andes.
GMT is really an exciting thing because we know that over the last 400 years that telescopes have gotten bigger and that has allowed us to see things with better detail and to see fainter things and to figure out what the history of the universe has been. Our technology for doing this is getting better and better. We're able to build big mirrors and we know how to do this. We know how to build GMT. We know how to build its individual mirrors and put them together. We know that when you build a telescope view and the GMT will have a, a view that is 10 times sharper than the Hubble Space Telescope. And when you build a telescope that collects more light and the GMT will collect 100 times as much light as the Hubble Space Telescope does, that you are going to be able to do things that we can imagine and set out as our goals to look at the history of the universe, how things have changed, find out more about the dark energy and the dark matter. Those are things that we know you can do. But I think the really exciting things will be things that we haven't yet thought of, that the new questions that will come. The other part that's really interesting about a big telescope on the ground is that you can change it. That is, you can change the instrument. So I think that even when we build the telescope, that won't be its final form. Uh, those instruments will eventually be replaced by better ones that use the technology that's developed over the period from, from now to then. We know that uh, the universe has changed from a very homogeneous kind of uh, goo at the time of the Big Bang into a highly differentiated world where there are planets, stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies. The universe has gotten kind of interesting and complicated through the action of gravity over time. We'd like to see how that works. And uh, by looking at what happened long ago, which means looking at very distant, very faint galaxies, and looking in detail, which means having the resolution to kind of really see what's going on. No doubt revealing cosmic collisions far back in time and space. Not as close as the asteroid field, but still in our neighborhood, are other phenomena colliding in space. Out beyond the edge of our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a cloud of hydrogen gas called Smith's Cloud, after its 1963 discoverer, Gale Smith. It is traveling at 312 kilometers per second, and is about to collide into the Perseus arm of our galaxy well, in 27 million years or so. It was believed to have been ejected from the Milky Way some 70 million years ago. Why is still not known, but when it collides with the galactic arm, it will trigger a brilliant burst of star formation with enough gas to produce over 2 million stars. Another major event to occur soon is in the heart of our galaxy, where a supermassive black hole resides. This black hole's mass is a hefty four million times that of the Sun. ESO telescopes have been tracking the motion of stars around the giant black hole for 20 years. Although huge, it is currently supplied with little material and is not shining brightly. But that is about to change. Recently, they have discovered a cloud of gas traveling towards the gravity sinkhole on a collision course.
The cloud consists mainly of hydrogen gas, gas which we see anyhow in the galactic center all over the place. This particular cloud weighs more or less three times the mass of Earth, so it's a rather small and tiny blob only, but it glows very brightly in the uh, light of the stars which are surrounding the cloud. We really don't know where the cloud came from, but we do know that most of the material which is uh, currently flowing into the galactic center black hole comes from stellar winds, material which is ejected by nearby stars. It could be that this particular cloud also was coming from a you know, star ejecting material, but happened to produce a very compact and, and directed right at the black hole. Well, the next few years will be really fantastic and exciting because we are probing new territory. Here this cloud comes in, gets disrupted, but now it will begin to interact with the hot gas right around the black hole. We have never seen this before. We expect it gets hotter. It may even start emitting x-rays, very hard radiation, and then it gets disrupted. And then in the end, we expect it to fall into the black hole uh, once it's sort of going through all of this churning. As the astronomers watched, the cloud has been picking up pace as it gets closer to the giant black hole. Its speed has doubled in the last seven years, and it is now speeding towards the black hole at more than 8 million kilometers an hour. The astronomers have already seen the cloud's outer layers becoming more and more disrupted over the last few years as it approaches the black hole. The black hole, imagine it sitting here, has a tremendous gravitational force, and the cloud, as it comes in, it will be elongated and stretched. It will become essentially like spaghetti. It will be elongated and falling into the black hole. Observations of other massive black holes at the center of galaxies have revealed many varied phenomena. One galaxy's supermassive black hole is emitting a powerful outflow of material and, to the surprise of astronomers, is forming stars. Results from ESO's very large telescope are the first confirmed observations of stars forming in this kind of extreme environment. The discovery has many consequences for understanding galaxy properties and evolution. Black holes at the centers of galaxies still hold many secrets. Galaxies are the building blocks of the universe. The giant galaxies we see today, even our own, were built up from many smaller galaxies and construction isn't over. Today, full-grown galaxies approach and interact with each other. They may collide and eventually merge, growing larger and more influential. As the galaxies approach each other, the tug of gravity creates tides that distort their shapes. Stars and gas stream into new orbits. Sometimes they're completely ejected, trailing into the depths of intergalactic space. Clouds of gas are compressed in the chaos and ignite with intense rounds of new star formation. Computer simulations have been conducted and, compared to actual images of galactic collisions, an uncanny resemblance. Because stars create most of the chemical elements, each galaxy has a particular chemical makeup. This makes identifying groups of stars from different galaxies easier. This infrared image of our sky shows our point of view of the Milky Way, half a billion stars. Most are in our galaxy, some belong to companion galaxies that orbit our Milky Way, and some are in between. Astronomers have discovered that some groups of stars belong to a different galaxy called the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical, and the Milky Way is cannibalizing it. As the dwarf galaxy passes through the Milky Way's disk, 
gravitational tides stretch the dwarf stars into long streams that wrap around the galaxy's orbit. For the dwarf, it's a fatal attraction. For the Milky Way, just another one of several similar events in its history. something much bigger is headed our way, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. This is the Milky Way's biggest neighbor, of roughly the same size, mass and type, and it is speeding towards us. Astronomers say the crash will begin in about two billion years. Supercomputer simulation shows how the event may unfold over billions of years. The first path distorts the two great spirals. Stars are tossed into the intergalactic night like sparks thrown from a campfire, and our sun, complete with planets in tow, could be similarly ejected. Gravity will eventually merge Andromeda and the Milky Way into a bigger single entity. With a new generation of telescopes looking skyward, we are sure to discover more dangers lurking in the heavens, though fortunately for us, they are millions or billions of years in time and distance away.